So today, just uh, some housekeeping items. Um, I think we're all pretty well versed in these webinars by now, whether it's Teams or Zoom. Um, but today's webinar is being recorded. Um, we're hoping to, to post it on the Office of Planning and Development website, as well as um, the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services uh, YouTube channel. Um, so the first 40 or so minutes will be a facilitated discussion um, with the panelists after I give my little spiel um, here. And at the end of this, uh, we'll have about 10 or 15 minutes for questions from the audience. Um, we do ask that you hold the questions until that time. Um, and it'll be pretty obvious when that happens, I'll, I'll make it known. Um, the chat is open if you're having any difficulties or, or technical issues. Um, and Kirsten, if you could uh, enter your email into the, the chat, um, if anybody gets kicked out or or anything really, um, please email Kirsten Howard um, at the email in the chat uh, with questions. Um, and during the, the question and answer portion, um, again, use the chat or the raise hand function and we'll uh, hopefully get to everybody. Um, great, thank you, Kirsten, for that. Um, and after the panelists, it'll be followed by a presentation from our friends and colleagues in the Office of Planning and Development, uh, Katie Pite, State Flood Plan Management Coordinator, and Jennifer Gilbert, who is the Director of the Office of Planning and Development. Uh, it'll be a similar question and answer system. Um, please hold the questions until the presentation is completed, and we'll leave time at the end for uh, attendees to ask any questions of them. Um, and uh, Kirsten just entered her chat, her email into the chat. So that is great. Um, and with that, we'll, uh, we'll plug on forward. So today's agenda, welcome to overview. We're going through that right now. Um, panel discussion and we still got people coming in and Q and A, great. Um, so I'll introduce myself first. Uh, my name is Brendan Lynch. I am the Resilience and Flood Mitigation Specialist uh, with New Hampshire DES Coastal Program based out of Portsmouth. Um, my primary role with the coastal program is to coordinate the Flood Smart Seacoast project. Uh, it's a grant funded project and a coordinated effort between state departments, uh, including Homeland Security and Emergency Management, and the Office of Planning and Development, who has representation here today. Um, it also includes the regional planning commissions around the coast, Stratford and Rockingham. Um, and it's, the idea is to build regional capacity for greater coastal community, environmental, and social resilience in New Hampshire. Um, we do this by providing direct assistance to help coastal communities incorporate best available coastal flood risk science and decision making, um, adopting higher floodplain management standards, and a big key is accessing FEMA funding for these resilience projects. Uh, However, floodplain management is not just a coastal issue, so we're happy to see a wide range of representation uh, from throughout the state today. Um, a big focus of the Flood Smart Sea Coast is public outreach and education um, and planning for these future environmental changes. Uh, this education includes the floodplain management practices and how to create and maintain an effective management program at a local level. Um, whether you're a coastal community or inland community, uh, these programs can be difficult to get started and maintain. Uh, today, our goal is to identify and explain these intricacies, challenges, and best practices. Uh, so hopefully you can uh, identify and improve some of um, your own practices in your own community. Uh, so with all that being said, I'm happy to introduce our, our lovely uh, wide-ranging panelists from today. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll run down uh, the three of you. And um, when I call on you, if, if you could just give a brief um, rundown and, and background of your experience, as well as your role in uh, floodplain management within your community. Um, so we'll start, uh, David Robbins, Planning and Zoning Administrator from the Town of Lyme. Hi, good morning. Um, I basically uh, started out as a, a programmer in GIS and, uh, Took a job as the planning administrator for Lyme, and so I've kind of learned as we go along. But uh, my kind of uh, focus has always been on GIS, as that's my background. So I try to do as much as I can um, with our GIS system to try to uh, manage the floodplain, manage any of the issues, uh, locate buildings, potential buildings, 
um, that kind of thing. Great, thank you. And uh, next we have Kim Reed, who's the planning administrator from the town of Rye. Yes, thank you very much, Brendan. My name is Kimberly Reed. I'm the planning and zoning administrator for the town of Rye. And I started in 2006 and we were part of the community rating system. And my first day I was handed the file saying, here you go. So I got a very um, unique opportunity. I want to see it as an opportunity. I would go down to Emmitsburg. I did the, the uh, training uh, to learn how to be a uh, certified floodplain manager. I took the exam. Rye currently is no longer in the CRS, but we're trying to get back in. And I have been working since 2006 to really understand um, the intricacies of how the floodplain ordinance in Rye can better help the residents as we go forward, not only with the new maps, but with the climate change, because as everybody knows or should know that it's not just the ocean, it's riverines, it's from floodplain, it's from your stormwater. So as my role here as the planner, I look at applications that come before the planning board and the zoning board, and how do they relate to the uh, floodplain ordinance? Great, thank you. And uh, Michael Hagen, plans examiner from the city of Keene. Thanks for having me. Uh, I've been with the city of Keene for 22 years. I uh, started as a permit tech, worked my way up to uh, building inspector to commercial building inspector to plan examiner. I review all the uh, plans that come in uh, as well as all the floodplain permits for the city. Um, been a certified floodplain manager for about 10 years now. Um, and I went to Emmitsburg as well and uh, great class. If you get an opportunity to uh, go down there and learn, it's well worth it, uh, well worth the trip and the week long. Uh, they do a really unique uh, training that I've tried to implement with the New Hampshire building officials um, with uh, with that. So my uniqueness in, in, to this group and some of the other panelists is I, I do the building the building portion of it as well as the floodplain portion of it. So I bring a kind of unique portion to that. Absolutely. Thanks for being here. And uh, last but not least, uh, Jennifer Gilbert, the director of the Office of Planning and Development at the uh, for the state of New Hampshire. Good morning, everyone. Um, as Brendan said, I'm the director of the Office of Planning and Development, um, formerly Office of Strategic Initiatives, Office mm -hmm. of Energy and Planning. Um, I have been administering the uh, state's floodplain management program since 2005. Um, so I see familiar names on the uh, on the attendance, and I have worked um, with my fellow panelists for many years. So, um, and I thank them for participating in this. Um, I think all three of you are great examples of um, of what you do um, as best practices in floodplain management. So, right. all right, thanks. And, uh, with all that being said, we'll dive into some questions. Um, I'm hoping this can be more of a uh, an organic discussion too. And I have a few directed questions for each of you. Um, and if uh, you want to add on to another panelist statement or, or you have a, something to fill in extra, absolutely, please chime in. So great. We'll start with uh, Dave from Lyme. Um, if you could please explain your permitting process, um, including how and when you make a floodplain determination. Um, and also a, a great thing to focus on, too, is, is how do you document the process and explain those requirements uh, to the owner or applicant? You know, you know, everything starts with uh, having the owners uh, give me a plan with what it is they want to to do. Um, and I try to work with the owners, the property owner, to uh, figure out where the development's going to be. Um, and then I base, again, I, I have a very strong GIS background, so I base my first determinations on our GIS system. I have our parcel maps, aerial photography, some LIDAR data. Um, I have all the floodplain maps, um, plus a lot of other areas that are specific to Lyme. And I kind of do a, an overview of um, all these particular areas um, in relationship to where they want to put their development. And so I can uh, pretty much locate 
um, with the owner where the building is going to be on the, the aerial photography. Um, we can look at things like uh, how far it is from the edge of a road, how far it is from a building. Um, I can see stone wall uh, with the LIDAR data. And so we can get a very good understanding of where a development is going to be and then compare that to the floodplain maps. And in most cases, uh, it's fairly clear whether it's in or out. Um, if it's not real clear, we may um, ask the landowner to have a surveyor come in and um, establish exactly where the, the floodplain uh, begins and ends and, and where the building is uh, so that we know. Um, if the building is then in the floodplain, then uh, we open that discussion and say, OK, there's uh, more requirements that are that need to be met. Um, we also have the discussion of is it possible to move that building or that uh, development outside of the floodplain. Um, Lime is kind of unique in our zoning is we have uh, quite a few overlay districts. So you may look at a floodplain. Um, for us, mainly it's along the Connecticut River Valley. Um, a lot of that area is farmland and we have a conservation district for agricultural soils. So not only are we dealing with having to look at where things are in relationship to the floodplain, but in relationship with uh, some special conservation districts, which, you know, floodplain is one, we have another one for agricultural soils, one for steep slopes, uh, one for ridge lines. And so we look at all of these and see what affects the, the property and what affects the new development. Um, we can then uh, d have a discussion whether we can go to the Zoning Board of Adjustment for any relief. Uh, if that's possible, then great, we can have that conversation. Um, if not, then we have to talk about um, either developing elsewhere or what types of uh, things they have to do, especially the floodplain, to make sure that the new development is in compliance. Um, I use a lot of the the booklets that are provided by FEMA uh, to talk about um, what those requirements are, what types of flood proofing. Um, and then as far as documentation, we try to um, keep all those plans, um, any of the flood proofing that uh, they decide to use, we uh, keep all that information all stored in paper files. Um, we do not have a building inspector in town, so um, we are limited to what we call a zoning permit. We can't do a building permit because uh, we have no inspector to actually inspect structures. Um, so it is basically um, left up to me to make sure that when um, buildings put in place that it's in the right place. So I'll go out and uh, look at the structure, look at the measurements, make sure that things are um, in the right place and I try to do that uh, in stages uh, look you know if a, a foundation has to be put in I try to go look at the, the cellar hole um, look at that location look at the foundation itself all to try to make sure we catch anything ahead of time so that's pretty much our process great all right thank you and uh, next one is for for Kim um, do you have any internal standard operating procedures uh, regarding regulating the floodplain development? Uh, some examples, substantial improvements, substantial damage determinations, non-building development, uh, elevation certificates, or flood proofing certificates? So my, um, my role is the planning and zoning administrator, and we do have a building inspector. Uh, both of us are certified floodplain managers, and uh, we do have processes in place. Um, first of all, I'd like to speak to how a project is determined. So usually if somebody is coming in, they either go to the building department or myself and say, this is what we're thinking of doing. And if we go to either the D firms, we go to um, several different maps. Um, we also have the floodplain maps on our own uh, GIS on our own town server. So we try to make, and as we know, the structures are what 
is regulated. So you have to look to see, you could have one inch on, or you could have 10 feet on, but it's the structure. So we try to say, okay, if say you're gonna be demoing and rebuilding, why don't you move it away from the floodplain ordinance? We also have a coastal like line. We have a lot of overlays. A lot of the development that we see is down by the coast. So we have a coastal overlay district, which also may run in tangent with our floodplain ordinance. So we, a few years ago, had a higher standard of a two foot elevation. This is even before the building code came out mandating the two foot um, freeboard. We had already had freeboard in our system. So what we do is we have a process. So if an application, um, we don't generally allow variances to the floodplain ordinance. We allow variances to side setbacks. We may coastal for height. But uh, since I've been doing this job, we have never given a variance to the floodplain ordinance itself. Uh, we try to work uh, so that we don't do that. Um, so what we do is if they come in and they do have something that's going to be in the floodplain, they have to fill out an application with the, we have a whole process for certified floodplain management application. They have to say what kind of structure it's going to be. If it's a VE zone, if it's a velocity zone, is it an AO, AE zone? And with those come the different standards. Is it going to be on piles, piers? And all of that is regulated by our building department. Um, and they keep very good records. We have um, color code systems here in the town of Rye. Um, so if it's, a, if it's in a floodplain ordinance, um, it's an orange file folder. If it's gonna get a variance, it's a green folder. But as I said, we don't give variances to the floodplain ordinance. Um, so in our, since we are a coastal town, everybody loves the beach. Everybody wants a view of the beach even though it's not always entitled. So we have a 28 foot limit, height limit in the coastal overlay district. But then people have started saying, well, that's not fair because we're now in the AO zone or the AE zone and we have to go up. So we changed our ordinance. If you're in the coastal flood area and in the special flood hazard area, you're allowed that two foot for freeboard if you can prove that it's you know, for the standards for RISE floodplain ordinance. Um, and sometimes people come and they want the 10 foot ceilings and it's more for aesthetics. And we're like, no, 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 we're not gonna give you a 36 height if it's for aesthetics. And we've seen some really good people build to the standards and get a decent home building within the codes and the regulations. And if it's in the special flood hazard area, we have a three, minimum three inspections. They go out and inspect it for uh, when they do the foundation. And um, we also have to certify, they have to get the, um, excuse me, the um, certificates of, not certificates of occupancy, the, um, I'm having a brain cramp. Um, they have to go and have it measured. Elevation certificate. Thank you, Jennifer, thank you. So they have to have the elevation certificate. So they have to have that at the beginning because we wanna know where's that first floor going to be. So it's very well documented um, through our building department. Great, thank you. And uh, Kim did mention uh, some higher standards. So uh, Mike, the flood provisions in the state building code do have higher standards than the requirements of the National Flood Insurance Program or the NFIP. Um, and Keen, how do you administer both requirements within your community? Um, so since I've been here since 2001, uh, We've always had the higher regulatory standards um, in our ordinance. Um, as you've seen in the building code, or the uh, residential building code under um, section R322, that uh, gives you the requirements, the new standards or the minimum NFIP standards in the uh, right in the residential building code. Um, me and Jennifer are still working with the state building code review board, excuse me, <clears throat> on uh, uh, adopting appendix G. Um, but it it overlays a little bit into zoning, which people don't. Uh, a lot of people on the board were concerned about that it would get into um, zoning and planning portions uh, with subdivisions and so on and so forth. They were may uh, um, overlap a little bit. But um, in Keene, we we have a similar setup um, as you can see behind me uh, in the gray files. Our floodplain permits 
we have the green files for residential permits and uh, red for uh, commercial. And then there's obviously uh, new buildings, any new commercial yellow, any uh, uh, new residential are orange. Uh, helps us delineate as well as we stamp all of the um, permits uh, right on the front of the file floodplain permit so that anybody looking at that file can say, oh, this is in the floodplain. I need, I need to know. I need to look a little further into it. It helps right off the bat to just plaster it. I mean, it's a big stamp <laughs> um, right on the front of the file. Uh, it lets everybody know uh, it's been great over the years uh, to have GIS as part of that and working with our permitting program of um, uh, iWorks, it uh, allows us to flag properties. So that automatic comes up, as soon as you enter a permit, it will say, this is in the floodplain. Um, and it will say, this is in the historic district, or this is in the um, you know, uh, hillside development ordinance and so on and so forth. So steep slopes ordinance, uh, all the other ones that come along with that, I'm sure you guys deal with. Uh, but it, it triggers it right off the bat. So we know from the very beginning how to start it. And it's been with the help of the GIS technician to uh, incorporate that into our permitting software. So if you have permitting software, um, they may be able to take that information or that data that's already in the GIS system and put it into your uh, permitting system that allows you to just double flag it because you never want to miss it. <laughs> it's always harder to deal with it after the fact. Um, uh, as far as the, uh, uh, we require two separate permits. We require a floodplain permit because it requires some specific information. Having a higher regulatory standard under um, Chapter 25 of our zoning ordinance uh, or our land development code, it's not in our zoning uh, for a specific reason because we don't issue variances for floodplain regulations. Um, some of the additional things that are higher regulatory is we, we do require one foot free board but we also require compensatory storage. So compensatory storage is no net loss. So you have to show that any, any development that you're creating or any rise in elevation, you have a depression on site to maintain that water so that it doesn't change um, uh, down, it doesn't change the hydrology uh, of the rest of the neighboring properties. Yeah, those are those are all great and uh, seem to be very applicable in, in other towns. So hopefully people are taking notes. Um, and this next one, uh, this next question is kind of for all, all three of you. I'll start with Dave um, because it is difficult explaining um, the requirements of these types of applications and these types of projects. Um, in your experience, what are some of the best ways or, or most effective ways to explain uh, floodplain development requirements to an applicant uh, or a property owner or even the general public stopping by your office? Um, yeah, what are some of the some of the good tactics that you use? Um, one of the, the best things I have found is, uh, again, having the GIS uh, data available, I can um, do a very quick map that shows them their property, where the floodplain uh, lies on their property. Um, and that kind of gives them something definitive to work with. Like they, they're not seeing it as I'm just saying there is a floodplain there. They can see it. Um, and then, uh, like I said, a lot of the, the books that uh, FEMA provides on how to uh, floodproof a house, um, you know, we can sit down and start going through some of the, the different things that can happen and then you know, have the conversation about um, hiring an engineer to actually engineer all of this. Um, that's usually a, uh, the, the most difficult part of the task is to um, realize that they need to spend more money on the project than they were expecting. Um, and so, you know, try to at least um, give them an idea of what's what it is we're requiring and why. You know, when we look at flood proofing, you know, not just setting things up on stilts, but having um, foundations that are it can uh, open and close, allow flood water in and out, um, showing those types of designs so they understand uh, what's going on, understand that, you know, why the first floor has to be above a certain elevation, why that has to be certified. Um, and so um, really just sitting down and having uh, the conversation and having some materials to point to to say, this is how it's done. 
or how it can be done. Um, it gives them a little better idea. It's not uh, this big unknown and they're not, you know, when they go to talk to an engineer, they've already seen some of these things and uh, makes a little more sense to them. Great, and Kim, maybe you could speak a little bit to how you handle the, the coastal questions. <laughs> Well, it's difficult in the coast because we're pretty much built out. And so what uh, we see is that uh, these old cottages, if um, a lot of people are coming in outside of the town and doing demos and rebuilds, and those are easier because if it's a demo and rebuild, we could say, okay, we treat it as if it's from scratch and you're in the flood special flood hazard zone. So this is how you have to build it. And, and we go over the requirements. We show them what the differences are between a, uh, AO, AE, and a, a velocity zone. Um, and we, sh we have the maps. Thank goodness, like Dave is GIS um, friendly. I am not, so it's we, we go over it together. And so we look at the maps and we say, okay, most of these people, if they're demoing and rebuilding, they're having an engineer or a surveyor um, help them as well. So we go over this and say, all right, this is what you need to build to. This is the standard. What we're seeing a lot of is that they're getting these legacy homes. Their grandfather built this and it's been handed down the family and they don't have a lot of funds and they're nickeling and diming it. And they're just, uh, you know, it may be in the special flood hazard zone, but they don't have the funds, but they want to bring it up to not maybe not code, but bring it up to certain standards. So I know we, I think we, you haven't um, talked about it, but there's that 50% rule. So how it works is if you're going to be doing substantial improvements that are 50% more of the, of the market value of the property, you have to bring the entire home into compliance. And this is what we're seeing a lot in Rye is they're like, they don't want to come up against that 50% rule. So where some people aren't even coming in to get the building permits, we're finding out after the fact, they're they're do, they're trying, they're doing it covert, they're doing it on the weekends or at night when hopefully the building inspector's not driving around and catches them. Or they're um, coming in for one permit, next year they come in for another permit, and so they, they don't have to meet that threshold. So those are the uh, procedures and the barriers that we have on the coastal area is that most of the homes are already built. And so what do you do? Um, we try to explain to people it's in your best interest because you don't want to have a home. And what if somebody's there and, and you know, the, even though it's a 1% or 100 year, we're seeing more, more of these storms on a regular basis. And it's for your own protection. This is what we try to tell them. It's for your own protection that we want to build it, build this to today's standards. And we saw this when the maps were changing in January uh, 29th and 2022. People were rushing to get their permits in because they didn't want to have to meet that um, the new standards. And I'm like, no, no, you should be looking at the new standards because you don't want to build it and have it gone in five years. So those are so, so those are the concerns we're seeing on the coastal side. So you stole my thunder, Kim. Uh, I was going <laughs> to mention it. In, in Keene, um, uh, seventy-eight percent of Keene is pre seventy-six. So we deal with a lot of old buildings, um, and like Rye, we're our, um, uh, out in the seacoast. Uh, there's not a whole lot of new development going in for uh, residential. Uh, most of the lots are all built out. Um, there are some zoning changes that are taking place now to reduce um, some of the um, surrounding uh, rural zones to reduce it from a five acre minimum to a two acre minimum to allow for some more development. But within this last year, we've seen uh, on average, um, the 22 years I've been here, uh, anywhere from five to seven homes a year. That's about it for new homes, um, but we do with, we deal with a lot of commercial permits um, because Keene is really the hub for Southwest New Hampshire. Um, so everybody comes here, they shop here, they got the um, uh, the hospital here, they do business in Keene. And uh, so during, during the night, we're about 26,000 and uh, during the day, we're up to 80,000. Um, so it's a big swing, you know, from, from night to day. Um, so a lot of people live or 
uh, reside outside of Keene but use Keene for commercial. Um, so that we deal with a lot of um, improvement. A lot of the commercial development is actually in uh, the flood, a lot of the floodplain in the bowl or the valley of Keene. Um, most of the residential is built up on the hillsides or on the edges uh, in West Keene or up on the hill, uh, which again, you deal with steep slopes and all the other stuff that comes in uh, for that. But we deal with a lot with that substantial improvement, um, substantial damage, you know, um, which is the other major part of it is sometimes they don't have a choice. And how do you explain that to them? Uh, like now you got to fill in your basement. Um, it's not an easy conversation um, to, ha to have with someone that just purchased a home now in Keene is, you know, minimum single family home is $300,000. I know that doesn't compare to the, the coast, but uh, in Keene, that's a big jump from what it used to be. A single family home was 150, you know, a really decent one was 199. You know, that was considered pretty high. Uh, and again, you're you're buying a pre 76 home, so it's not really up to standard any up to current standards. So um, to tell someone they just bought a house for $300,000 now they've got to eliminate their basement is a tough conversation. But again, we we because we are a CRS uh, community, we explain that. This is overall benefit for the whole community. Um, we get a discount um, just because you don't want to comply with the minimum requirements. Uh, you shouldn't subject to the people that are complying with it and that receive that discount for flood insurance. So when you explain that to them, that their decisions impact the full community or could impact the full community, um, it they, they say, oh, this is a program that's put in place to for the good of the community. And uh, I think that goes over better. Uh, when you explain it that way, uh, uh, they don't seem as um, upset. Obviously, they're upset about losing the basement, but uh, we try and work with them and, and give them as many options as possible, um, either through a, a, a LOMA um, where they, you know, first thing they got to do is get an elevation certificate because we need to know what we're, we're working with for that building and uh, get an elevation certificate. I know it costs money, but it's a $1,200 investment that may give you other avenues than just filling in a basement or flood proofing a commercial building um, it, or elevating elevating the structure so um, they, it, it all starts with that elevation certificate um, for, for us in the community yeah there are definitely different difficult conversations to have um, and Jana I see you down in the corner of my screen and um, hoping to get your opinion on the topic too and uh especially from a state level trying to explain these requirements um so any insight you can provide is uh would be great sure um so through our program at the state um so we coordinate the national flood insurance program for fema we partner with them um and our role really is to provide technical assistance and training um to all stakeholders in the state so we're constantly communicating with um, community officials, um, the public, engineer surveyors, um, realtors, you know, anybody that has a question, we're answering their question. So you're dealing with a program that comes from the federal government. Um, as we all know, it's very bureaucratic, can be very um, full of acronyms and full of very technical information. So. We've learned how to kind of take those regulations and kind of make it understandable for everybody, um, especially when you're getting a call from a property owner that for the first time they've been introduced to a, um, the floodplain situation. Um, they've bought a home, their lender, or they're about to buy a home, their lender is requiring flood insurance. What is this all about? Or a property owner that um, bought a home and wants to build. Um, so it's just trying to find those ways of explaining to them in common, common terms about what exactly that they need to do and explaining why they need to do it. Um, this is a life safety thing. Um, so it's just finding ways to do that without the acronyms, without the um, very technical terminology. So it is a it's it's something that I've worked on over the last 18 years in working on this program. Um, but um, we're trying to find ways to help the communities um, explain this to their residents. And then we're also working 
constantly working on it um, with our technical assistance and our training. Awesome, thank you. Um, and to kind of keep the keep the idea going with best practices, um, and I think I've come from a municipal level and now I'm working for the state, but um, and I'm sure our panelists deal with it almost daily, um, enforcing these regulations and dealing with uh, violations. Um, Dave, what are some of the best practices that you found for um, number one, enforcing regulations and number two, um, addressing violations? Um, well, if I can start with the addressing violations, um, we we're actually kind of fortunate. Um, we don't have a, a huge amount of development that's currently within the, the floodplain. Uh, again, a lot of the, the floodplain in this area is uh, farm fields, um, which are protected in several different ways. Um, we also have a lot of community members who are conservation minded and a lot of the, the fields along the Connecticut River actually have conservation easements on them prohibiting development. Um, so they're, they will stay in their natural state in perpetuity, which is uh, great for me. <laughs> but, uh, you know, any type of enforcement, I always try to start with uh, just having the, a conversation with the landowner and saying, this is what I found, this is the violation that I see, and uh, here are the things that we can do to fix that. And I always think, you know, telling someone that they have a violation that needs to be fixed uh, without some sort of uh, discussion of how it can be fixed uh, doesn't work well. Um, it kind of you know, feels heavy handed. Um, I always want to work with people, um, not against them. That's uh, it just makes everybody happier in the long run. Um, and it, it makes people uh, feel more comfortable coming in and having discussions with me. Um, I found I've been here um, about 13 years and um, there were people that used to, it was a very hard time getting them to uh, do permits. I would, was constantly finding properties that they were repair, doing work on, not getting permits. And just over the years working with them, um, now they come in and get a permits. So um, trying to just make the whole feel of the office um, approachable has been um, a huge help. Um, it's a lot of work sometimes, but uh, that's what's really worked for me. Um, as far as best practices for doing the enforcement, again, I, I think um, start out with uh, a gentle nudge and then work your way up to uh, whatever needs to be done to uh, get the enforcement done. Um, but usually people are fairly receptive and it doesn't take more than a, a gentle nudge to get them to comply, at least in, in my experience. Now, you know, that, that's, uh, there are, we don't have the pressure that Keen and Rye have. Um, you guys have, some intense um, pressure for development. Um, you know, I know Keene, I, I grew up near Keene, so I'm very familiar with Keene. I've been there many, many times, and I can understand you, know, you have a river that runs through your downtown. Um, <laughs> that uh, I remember it was about 10 years ago, you had a very bad flood. Um, we don't quite have that kind of pressure. Um, you know, the Connecticut River um, it doesn't, it, there are dams on the river that control a lot of that. Um, it can come up a certain amount, but we haven't seen anything, even with the, the big storms. Um, some of the big things that we have uh, that's caused damage have been uh, some of these large rainstorms that uh, just create huge amounts of runoff. And uh, it comes down, hits the roads and, uh, clogs all the the culverts and washes out our roads. Um, so that's something also that uh, we have to deal with, with um, you know, getting uh, permitting through the state for uh, enlarging culverts. Um, I do a lot of work with our highway department to try to um, get their permitting for 
uh, culverts because you know we're seeing greater and greater amounts of rainfall and greater and greater amounts of washouts because of it. Right. Yeah. No, I think I think one of your tactics to to address the violation, but also have a plan for guiding them through that violation is, is key. Um, you don't just want to throw them a violation and say good luck, you know, it, and build that relationship with them to help them through it. Uh, right, Mike, I see you want to say something. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just going to add along, um, you know, conversation is the most important, you know, having a, a, a conversation with a, um, with someone who is in violation is important. But one thing I've learned over the years is you got to document, you know, uh, if I can say anything to the people here that have to deal with enforcement, um, making sure that after that conversation, you document it, um, follow up with a letter or some information so that, you know, uh, positions change, people change, you know, this enforcement's, you know, not going away. It's important to document um, and, and have that information that if you do uh, end up next door or uh, wherever your courthouse is, uh, you know, for enforcement, um, and having the ability and following your um, uh, fee or fine schedule under 674, you know, that gives you that ability to, to do the enforcement action is, is a critical part in looking at your ordinance or if you're looking at putting in an ordinance um, uh, where you have the ability to do that and, and what those levels are. So um, if I could just add one thing is just to uh, make sure that it's documented, uh, especially for violations, because then it starts time frames. Um, it, it gives um, they need to find um, times we, we've been dealing with a, a couple of open violations. And the, the best thing we could have done is give deadlines and, and, and make them uh, uh, meet those deadlines. Now, can you be flexible? Has something changed or new information come up? and you have the ability to move that deadline, absolutely. Um, but document, you know, so now, hey, we're giving you an extra 30 days to come up with this material, or we have another uh, 14 days to have another meeting or come back with uh, a solution or an engineer. Or, um, so if those are things I could help out with on the enforcement and document, uh, give deadlines. And Kim, same question to you down the coast dealing with second homes and, and coastal communities is, is not an easy task. Brendan, I'm, I'm at a loss on this one because I am not the code enforcement officer, nor am I the building inspector. So I don't get involved with the enforcement side of it. Um, I only find out about it afterwards when we have our CAV visit or our CAV follow-up. Um, right. And I do know uh, that the building inspector has told uh, Jennifer and our and, and our other FEMA reps that he tries to communicate. Um, but what I have found is that usually um, we find them through uh, usually when they go to get raided. Um, so I can't really speak to what the enforcement side of it is since I'm on the planning side. I'm sorry. Sure. No, that's all right. Jen, do you, do you have any uh, follow up to that? Maybe a little more insight? Sure. Um, so sometimes it comes out of, as um, Kim alluded to, um, FEMA and the state um, do what they call community assistance visits or CAVs. Um, so we come into a community, we look at your permit of documents, and we're looking for to make sure that everything is um, compliant with what needs to be done. And do on occasion we do um, find some issues, um, and then we work with the communities to help address those. Um, violations. Um, the town of Rye did go through a multi-year um, compliance case, but I think um, it was a really good thing. It was a really, it was probably my biggest compliance um, issue that I had to deal with in the state, but I think it was a really good process um, between FEMA, the state, and the town of working through it. Um, there were multiple property owners. Each one had a different case, but I think the town all of us worked well together and worked through that. Um, so I think, as Mike alluded, it's documentation is key to um, enforcement cases and keeping with deadlines. Um, certainly things happen um, on FEMA side, on the state side, on the town side, property owner side. Um, so it can take a bit, um, but in the end, you can 
usually come to a good resolution um, and it helps make the property owner safer um, even if they aren't, aren't able to be brought into full compliance so thank you jennifer we did uh in the in the past and i was trying to stay forward for the current um, present day but jennifer and the town and i and we've had turnover uh, for staff jennifer and i are the only two who are still present we know about these there were multiple homes and we did have to have the discussion you do have to fill your basement and we had one guy who told us he has more money than god and he will fight us <laughs> luckily he did not uh we but we looked into it you know how do you that's how we knew we could not give a variance to the our floodplain ordinance there's a process you have to look at the the, the codes and you have to go down a very very narrow road um to get somebody off of uh you know give them a variance and i want to suggest work with these homeowners, work with your town, work with your state, work with your NFIP coordinators, because you can mitigate. Um, and it is a long, lengthy process, but it is doable. And Rye is a great example of it is doable. Uh, that's a great add on. Thanks, Kim. Um, and Kim mentioned um, elevation certificates earlier. Um, Dave, how do you utilize FEMA's elevation certificate. Um, yeah, just kind of a, a catch all. It's kind of a, a process, but yeah, if you could just give a brief rundown of how you utilize it, that'd be great. Uh, mainly, I use it when uh, we, we have a teardown or some sort of um, new built, new construction. Uh, we use that to first of all ensure that. Uh, the, the first floor is going to be where it should be as far as elevation goes. Um, and it, it's a good starting point and it kind of keeps everybody in the, the process so that when the, the homeowner uh, puts in their foundation, caps it, um, then I try to have them have that first, you know, before they start any of the framing, any of the um, construction, have that elevation certified and then we know we're all starting from uh the right place um it, that way you know I, i've had people say well once it's all done we can get that certification done and i no, no I, I want it done ahead of time because i don't want any mistakes made i don't want you to have to go back and uh tear down stuff just so that you can bring it up again it, it's uh Again, you, explaining to people that um, doing it right the first time is a lot cheaper than doing it a second time. And so, um, like I say, I like the, to have the, the elevation certificates done um, right after the, the foundation is set and they, they've capped um, whatever they're going to so that we know where the first floor is going to be. Right. And Mike, I imagine it's a similar answer, but I'd love to hear your perspective on it. Uh, same. And, and just uh, explaining, I mean, when you're dealing with new development and uh, uh, you're dealing with a bunch of different people, right? You're dealing with a contractor, you're dealing with the homeowner, you're dealing with the, um, the, the site developers that understand um, the engineers who may apply for the permit, but they may not be pushing that information on to um, the, the site GC. So it's important um, to, if you have inspectors, to let them know, hey, this is why we plaster these, um, uh, uh, the files, um, letting them know that, hey, this is one of those ones you're going to have to have that special conversation and make sure that it's on the inspection card um, and explain exactly when those um, points are, need to be hit. So we do the same thing foundation because that's really where everything starts if stuff has to move or be elevated now is the time to address that before a whole building is up because then we're going to try to do something else like flood proofing and then they're not meeting the minimum standards again uh, there's no variance for the building code um, and there's no variance for our floodplain um, really it just comes down to interpretation you can uh, uh, if you if the applicant feels that uh, we're not interpreting it to their development, then they can appeal it to uh, the Building Code Review Board or uh, the local uh, Building Code Review Board 
Um, but you really don't want these going to the zoning board because they they have no idea what you know um, <laughs> what the standards are for floodplain. You're going to sit there for 45 minutes explaining you know what it is, uh, and they're they're still you know they're either attorneys or or real estate agents that sit on the zoning board and, and have no idea what the floodplain is. That, yeah, we know the water rises, but we don't know how to address it. And and really to give that opportunity for variance is, is, is tough. You know, Keene is very, you know, we know that we flood about every five years. And um, over time, it's gotten less and less. You know, from about 2003, which was three and nine were our worst ones, uh, where we had about Forty uh, percent of buildings affected in the city of Keene by a flood event. So um, that's a that's a huge number, um, and it disrupts everything for weeks and weeks and weeks after the flood recedes. And dealing with uh, making sure power can get put back on, um, it, it strains a lot of resources. So if you can get those things addressed ahead of time, so that that building will not be affected by an event, um, that's that's the best way to do it. And and again. Talking with the applicant up front and, and having that conversation, especially for um, commercial projects and um, new single family, go to the site, make sure your building inspector is involved um, so that they understand that there's going to be this little extra step um, in getting the elevation certificate. It, it's pretty standard. Uh, we don't have a lot of kickback here in Keene. Uh, they know this is the point where it needs to be done, and most of the developers that are involved in it try to stay in contact with the um, general contractors to make sure that that happens because we not only write it on the site plan but we also write it on the the building permit as well as a floodplain permit so there's three different areas where they can say oh, i had no idea no it's here here and here uh so uh you, you can't miss it um so it, it just helps but again putting it in the forefront on your applications um you know even stamping uh, uh the uh, uh the permit itself saying floodplain on it will will make them aware uh, when they put post that on a building that hey what do we got to do for this floodplain uh, when they hand that permit to the um, <clears throat> to the builder uh, it may be helpful so. and I just added you know Lyme and we're a very small town I am building and zoning that's <laughs> that's it I there's nobody else here to that takes care of this um, one of the things I do is on the permit itself, um, I have a section for conditions. And so if I require a elevation certificate, um, I can put that right on the permit. And so when I issue the permit, it's there and they know it has to happen. And they're, you know, not only me telling them, um, but there is also the, it's right there on the permit. Great, yeah, good tactic. Um, and Kim, last last but not least on this input. So for, you know, the good, as the planner, I have been working, we've been very fortunate to have a consistent zoning board and planning board. And for the longest time, our, our, we used to have attorneys who come in and would present to our zoning board and said, FEMA's flood ordinance. And I would say, no, it's RISE floodplain ordinance, RISE. And so we have a really good zoning board that says, Kim, what's the rules? What's going on? So I've been educating them over the years, and I actually have, you can't see it because it's we're on the screen, but we have a zoning board meeting this coming Wednesday, and one of the applications, and I, I always put on the bottom of every, uh, what, what the relief they need, I say property is in the general residence, coastal overlay district, and special flood hazard zone AE8. So it is noticed right on the legal notice that gets sent out to abutters, sent um, on to the Portsmouth Herald, and uh, the property owner and the Board of Adjustment know. So our board has come in. So if it's a tear down and rebuild, or, or in this case, they're building, um, it's a, we don't have a lot, but it is a vacant property. Um, they, get, they, they want to see that uh, elevation certificate. They want to know, are you putting in an elevation certificate? They want to know where the grade is. Where are you building up from that grade? So these are this, this has been a long time in the making, but those elevation certificates have become important. Um, we're not going to give any uh, variance relief to the floodplain ordinance, but if you are going to be granted to build in this area, our zoning board wants to know that it's being built properly. 
Great. Thank you. And and looking at the time, um, I do want to leave a, a few minutes uh, for questions and answers. Um, I did have one last question about higher standards, but I know um, Katie Pite is going to be covering that in her presentation. Um, and maybe, Jen, I'll, I'll look for guidance from you if you're okay with just moving to questions and answers from the audience. I think we could we have about 10 minutes before um, before we should head to Katie's presentation. I think that should be enough time if anyone has questions. Yep, that sounds good. All right, well, we will uh, open it up. If anybody has any questions, either raise their hand and we'll, we'll call on you or uh, put them in the chat. If not, I can ask my final question. <laughs> and I'll just, um, Brendan, I'll just want to go back to that uh, while we're waiting to see if there's questions about the yeah, elevation absolutely. certificate. Um, the elevation certificate is a best practice as it is. Um, the minimum standard um, for the National Flood Insurance Program is that communities keep as built data on file. It doesn't say how you do it, um, but we've always encouraged um, communities to use the elevation certificate. Um, the city of Keene is in a community rating system, so they are required to keep elevation certificates. Um, Rye was in CRS, so they've just continued that process. Um, and it's great to hear that Lime is doing that. Um, and I think this is what kind of what are the best um, blend of everything of what's going on in New Hampshire is we have um, very rural communities that don't have building inspectors. Some of them don't even have zoning. So it's great to hear. Um, from Dave of kind of what their best practices are, because a lot of our communities in the state are similar to Dave um, and Lyme in that they don't have a lot of flooding going on. They don't have a lot of development going on, um, but um, they have a lot of great best practices. And then um, Mike is a good example with a building inspector in a larger community. And Ken is a good example of a coastal community. So I think I saw something come up. So. Yeah, we do have one from our, our very own Kirsten Howard, uh, Resilience Program Coordinator for uh, DES. And uh, Mike, this one is for you. Um, I'd love to hear more about how Keen enforces compensatory storage and maybe some thoughts from Jen or Kim if compensatory storage will be possible to enforce in coastal communities. So Mike first, and then now uh, hit the second part with uh, Jen and Kim. So like dealing with the floodplain, it's really you're relying on data that's provided to you. You're not doing, um, you're, you're just verifying and getting information from the, uh, from the engineers. And uh, uh, it, it's not something that a um, homeowner can put together and present to you and you're crunching numbers. Um, the, the compensatory storage is, you know, if you're filling in a foot, you're taking out a foot. Um, it, it's a it's a no net loss um, for for Keene's ordinance, um, and uh, it, it's a uh, um, it, it's it's done well. Um, we have seen a reduction in certain areas um, after we started uh, doing this back in I want to say that came into play in 2008 or maybe 2010. Um, after I know we were working on it before the big flood. And then afterwards, um, it, it became enforced. Uh, it, it's a uh, it's engineering data that you're looking at. You're verifying that there's no net loss. So whatever they're filling in, uh, that they're depressing in another area in the lot that allows for that compensatory storage. I hope that helps answer a little bit of the question. We don't do a lot with compensatory storage in Rye because it's mostly for a floodway and floodways are basically your riverines and your rivers. What we're seeing in Rye is uh, the infringements upon um, the ocean or, or marsh. Um, we have talked about it with the Zoning Board of Adjustment and the Planning Board as to how should we regulate comp uh, compensatory storage. And so we're very interested in hearing more, um, but we don't have, believe it or not, a floodway in Rye. Um, so I, I would love to hear more from Jen and thank you, Michael, for sharing. Yeah, so compensatory storage is not a requirement through the NFIP. Um, so we only have three communities in the state that have compensatory storage requirements specifically to floodplain regulations. Keene, um, Raymond, um, after the, a flood events in 2006 and 2007, 
they adopted similar regulations as what Keene has. Um, and then also the town of Salem also has compensatory storage requirements. So it's really geared towards um, addressing that storage issue. So if you have a lot of development, if you have a river running through your through the middle of your town, um, it is a good opportunity to help relieve whatever is being placed in that floodplain to take an equal amount out of that. So um, I'm not sure about the coastal. That is a good question, Kirsten. Um, I'll have to, um, I'm going to make a note about looking at that from other states to see if they have that in their coastal communities. Thank you for that explanation. But all, all three of that was all that all sounded great. Um, and the yeah, the coastal and the floodway. That's an interesting one, Kim. I didn't realize Rye didn't have one. Um, so yeah, all that. I mean, I, I don't see anything else in the chat or any raised hands. Um, we have a few more minutes until um, or at least scheduled Katie's presentation. So um i figured i can ask my, my last question um and it's specific to to higher standards um and and dave we, have, we haven't heard from you in a few minutes so um i'm wondering if lime has any higher standards uh for floodplain regulations and if you don't maybe what uh barriers might uh, stop you from applying them more uh, we do not have any higher standards um we do have a separate uh floodplain district that we look at um but it just looks at it or points back to the the standards um from fema uh so we you know technically don't um at the moment the the minimum standards seem to be working well for us um and again we're kind of unique um we don't have any uh commercial development um, in any of the floodplains. Uh, we don't have any, uh, we all, well, it's all residential development. And uh, in the most part, um, it's set back, but there's not a huge amount of it. So even the, um, people trying to rebuild, um, it doesn't quite make sense to um, have higher standards at the moment. You know, I think it's something that we will yeah. continue to monitor um, again with, uh, global climate change, we're seeing much larger uh, storm events. And so we, you know, we absolutely want to keep that in mind. But at the moment, uh, the, the minimum standards seem to be working well for us. Great. Yeah, Mike, go ahead. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, sorry, I, I like to talk, so you can shut me up anytime. But um, one of the things that really helped us recently in our ordinance was with the um, uh, uh, substantial damage, substantial improvement. Again, Keen pre, you know, 78% of Keen is pre 76. So um, we deal with it a lot uh, or have to look at it a lot with with permits that are, are being done in the, or anything that's being done in the uh, or damage that's done in those locations. And, you know, under our ordinance, we didn't have at the time a, a set date for um, uh, when does that 50% come into play, right? So is it for the history when it was built in 1829? Um, it's certainly 50% more nowadays than it was in, at that time that it was built. So one thing that we put in the ordinance, helpful or not, was we did it five years back, right? So whatever the appraised value was up to five years back, we put a date on it. Um, and uh, really to give us a a starting point and and it's come a lot different I, again what like i was explaining is homes are a lot more expensive than they used to be uh so to hit that 50 percent mark um where people are wanting to do improvements to their homes um how do you how far back do you go to get that that value of or increased value of 50 percent so we actually put in our ordinance um when we adopted the new land development code uh in uh, uh Two years ago uh, that we put it as a five year mark um, just to help everybody understand, you know, these are the numbers we're going with and everything should be reasonable within that five years versus going back to 1980. You know, certainly the cost of doing things, you know, from 1980 to 2022 is, is a substantially more. So I, I don't know if that's helpful to communities, but 
that was one thing that we struggled with in this community was determining that substantial damage, substantial improvement. Yeah, I think if one community is struggling with it, there's got to be more. Um, and Kim, a, a couple questions came into the chat, but um, a brief elevator speech for any higher standards in the, the town of Rye. So I can speak to both of those questions uh, that came in on the chat, but I'm going to talk to or, higher yeah, take standards. Take that away, yeah. So for higher standards, we do have the two-year, uh, I mean, excuse me, two-foot uh, free board we put in um, before the uh, building code was amended. And we are actually, Michael, thank you, because we are actually having the discussions with Jennifer Gilbert and with Katie right now as to trying to change. Uh, we've had a, a three different, three or four different building inspectors since I've been here. And there was never really a process and nobody ever said what they did. So the current building inspector really didn't have a time frame and um, was going, you know, from like the history of the since the beginning it was built. And as you said, we've got a lot of 1800, 1900 structures. So we are working with um, Jennifer Gilbert and, and Katie to putting in 10 years. But I'm, I'm curious, to, I want to go back and look at your five year language. Uh, we have a floodplain management. Uh, manual, which needs to be updated. It, I, I wrote it in 2009. The select board approved it in 2010. Um, and so we, we need to update that manual and then get it, whether we want to put it in the floodplain ordinance, the building code or the zoning ordinance. Uh, we have to figure that out for next year's um, so we can get it on the ballot to get it uh, voted in by the people. As for um, one of the questions I, I think was by Thomas Matthew Thorne, do planners uh, intersect with emergency managers? I could answer that because and I'm actually also Kim, if I could just Kim, if I could just jump in before you answer that, Mike might have had a response. Oh, I did. I would keep it out of the building code. Um, currently under RSA 155A, any changes to the building code now has to be uh, presented to the building code review board. Um, so. I would keep it in the floodplain ordinance and and not mess with the building code. Um, one, we want to try as you know, as a member of the building code review board, we're trying to be consistent throughout the state of New Hampshire. Um, and if you do make the change, it only has to be posted on the state website under the Department of Safety Building Code Review Board, so that all architects and engineers can go to one website and know how to build in that community. So either it's the minimum state standards. Um, that everybody plays by the same rules, or if you have uh, additional higher regulatory standards, you can go to the Building Code Review Board website and see what those are. Currently, right now, Nashua has it posted on there, Portsmouth has theirs posted on there. So if there are things that exceed the Building Code um, requirements, they would need to be posted on that website. Um, you can't have anything that's less than the minimum requirements, but anything that is, you, you, you know, communities are required by law um, under this past uh, um, uh, when the, the 2018s got adopted to put those ordinances uh, or higher regulatory standards like Durham um, goes by the newest energy code, right? So they have to look at the those requirements as, as to the two, which ones are more stringent, right? So, uh, you know, currently the state of New Hampshire is under 2018, uh, but the Durham is under the um, 2021 code requirements. So I just want to add that I would stick with it in the ordinance um, because then there's no, uh, you're not changing the building code. And Thank I you, can help Michael. with that if you, if you need any help. Because so. since I'm not a, a building inspector, I, I follow the ordinances for the planning and zoning. So that was great news. Thank you very much for sharing. Um, and then there was the question from um, Matthew Thorne. I am also uh, an emergency um, on the emergency management team. So we are very unique here in Rye in that I coordinate with the emergency management director who also happens to be our uh, chief of police. And so we work together with the building departments. And uh, we have, um, I've been through four now all hazard mitigation um, updates. And we really bring in last the last hazard mitigation update. We even brought in the planning board chair and the zoning board chair. So we do have interdepartmental interdepartment, um, you know, reviews on the all hazard mitigation plan. So it, it is incorporated. So we do know where the special flood hazard zones are and where the um, 
not difficulties, but we want to also bring in where there might be some areas of concern. This latest all hazard mitigation plan, we even brought in the superintendent of the Rye Water District and the sewer commissioner. And thanks to the this recent all hazard mitigation plan, the Rye, uh, cons the Rye Sewer Commission has now put together its own plan and realized they're working with, uh, they got a grant, they're working now to bring all of their pump stations up to code because they didn't realize that you know, they had some of them in the special flood hazard area and there were some things that they needed to do and they went and got a grant. So we, I don't know about other towns, but we in Rye um, do, you know, luckily because I'm the planner I and, and on the um, emergency management team, I do coordinate. So I can't speak for other towns. Dave, can you I speak can jump for your in town? also on that one? Again, Lyme is a very small community, so uh, when last time we did the, the hazard mitigation plan and we're up for an update here pretty soon, um, all departments are brought in, but uh, you know we have a highway department that consists of four people. Our fire department is all volunteer. Um, we have a, two officers in our police department. So um, we try to bring in as many people as possible uh, with many different perspectives uh, when we do an update. So. We do try to um, do as much um, cross departments as possible just because everybody has their own special uh, knowledge of the town. And so um, it, it helps bringing in absolutely everybody, but that's a small group of people because there just aren't that many of us. Right, and Mike, how about Keen? Any involvement or interdepartmental coordination with Emergency management? So it's evolved um, over many, many years of trial and error. Um, technology has come a, a long way. And uh, uh, part of being in this ARS program is that you, you have to include the public works and you have to show your plan for maintaining catch basins and uh, tax ditches and all that other stuff. Um, as far as the development end of things, we have um, uh, in the community development department, we used to be separated from planning. Now we're all one. Um, health code, zoning, uh, building and planning, right? So uh, we have for, for new projects, uh, every month we meet with developers for every department in the city of Keene. So we have uh, police, fire, planning, zoning, building, floodplain, health, uh, all of those things get included and all the people that specialize in those areas meet with a developer. And we kind of shotgun them on what could potentially be uh, help, uh, you know, pitfalls in the development that they're proposing or things that they have to either go to zoning board for, or, um, you know, this project gonna require planning either minor review or uh, major review from the planning board, um, as well as we've really been able to integrate any development project into our iWork system, which is our permitting software, to notify whenever we get a permit, we send out emails to uh, we need a, a, a driveway permit from Public Works. We need a, uh, a, a new address from Public Works. Uh, we, we send out um, for planning if there were any spe special site plan conditions. Um, we send them emails and they have to comment and approve and fire department, not, not so much police department, they don't get involved in a lot of the building development end of things, except for traffic studies and so on and so forth in the beginning of a major development. Uh, but the, uh, we, we've been able to do that through technology and it's been great. And then setting up that pre-submission meeting has been uh, great because you get to hear about um, other departments that do different things and being able to hear. And, and if you see something, you can say, oh, you're, you're really gonna go need to talk to them about this. Um, even if someone is up at the counter or makes a phone call, you should really start here. And that, that to uh, developers and, and new homeowners and um, it is great because then they can get it all up front and they're not getting uh, that process where they've gone 10 steps forward. Now they got to go two steps back. So if you can address things up front and really collaborate with with the different departments, it's a once a month meeting that really saves the whole city a whole lot of headache. And and really, <clears throat> did you go talk to public? Oh, yeah, yeah, I talked about the word. Or did you go talk about? Oh, yeah, 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 I talked about, you know, this gets everybody in the same room and on the same page with the same project that 
you know, because they may have changed it when they went to go talk with them. So that's really where this uh, process has helped uh, um, collaborate and get everybody together. I would encourage it. Uh, also, technology has come a long way um, to be able to send emails and get that information and have everybody's comments in one location on one project really helps. So absolutely if you can integrate yeah. that. Be good. That's a great suggestion. Um, and with a, a couple minutes left before we uh, jump into the Office of Planning Development's presentation, um, we have one final question directly for Kim. Um, what does RISE set as the certain time period during which repairs, reconstruction, alteration, or improvements are tracked for substantial improvement? Is there a best practice? No, right now it's for the life of the property or the structure, and we're struggling with that. So we're in the process of trying to change that. Uh, we have talked to Jennifer about 10 years, but uh, we may be changing that. Uh, I want to look at Keynes to maybe five years. So right now it's uh, really been um, per the building inspector it, at his discretion. So we don't have a good process, and I'm sorry to say that. I'll just add that um, Newcastle also adopted a five year period last year, so now we have two communities in the state that have that. Great. Good to hear. All right, well, I don't see any further questions and, and no other hands raised. So um, with that, I want to thank our panelists for taking the time this morning. Um, I know I told you all an hour, but the discussion was just too rich. I couldn't let you go. Um, so we appreciate it, uh, Kim, Mike, and Dave. Uh, we've got a few claps coming in. Um, and feel free to stick around for, for Katie's presentation. Um, there's going to be a QA and a uh, for OPD specific on the back end of this. Um, but I know you all have your own day-to-day -day work to get to. Um, so again, I, I appreciate everything. And thanks for taking the time today. You're welcome. All right. Katie, it's all yours. Great. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for being here and listening today. Um, at this part of our webinar, um, Jennifer Gilbert, who has obviously been on the panel, she's introduced herself, you've already heard her speak today. Her and I are going to be presenting on some best practices that we have and that we recommend to communities um, as well. So if you don't know who I am, my name is Katie Pate, and I am the State Floodplain Management Program Coordinator, and I work with Jen, and we administer the NFIP in New Hampshire. So here's just a brief agenda of our presentation coming up. I'm going to start with just a one slide overview of the, um, the National Flood Insurance Program or NFIP, just in case there's anybody on the call who maybe isn't as familiar as a lot of us are. Um, following that, the majority of our presentation is going to be giving um, best practices and, and ones that we can give off and, and give those resources to you. And then at the end, Jen will also be speaking briefly about the flood provisions in the state building code as well. So again, I just wanted to start real quick with one slide in case anybody here wasn't as familiar as you know quite a few of us are with the NFIP. So the NFIP, again, the National Flood Insurance Program is a voluntary partnership between FEMA and then participating communities. And those communities do, as it's voluntary, they do um, voluntarily join. Um, so when they join, communities agree to adopt local floodplain regulations that do meet the minimum requirements of the program, and then they enforce those regulations through the local permitting process. And then in return, flood insurance is made available um, for all property owners, renters, and businesses in the community through that national flood insurance program. So let's go through briefly um, the responsibilities that a participating community has. So first, um, the community must adopt floodplain management regulations that meet or exceed the minimum requirements of the program. This is done when the community joins the program, though over time there are um, opportunities or there's points when the community might even make amendments or they choose to adopt higher standards. Communities are responsible to administer a permit process for all development in a flood zone, and those flood zones are called special flood hazard areas, as we've heard many times already on this call today. Those special flood hazard areas, those are the areas indicated on the FEMA flood insurance rate map is the 1% annual chance flood. And so that permit process for any development occurring in those special flood hazard areas, that applies to both building development and non-building development as well. 
Communities are also responsible to make a floodplain determination for all development projects. So again, when a, a application or somebody comes in, it's asking that question, is this located in the floodplain? Communities are responsible to ensure that all the development in those special flood hazard areas is in compliance with the community's floodplain regulations. And that not only includes standards for new development, but also includes making those substantial improvement and substantial damage determinations for existing development that's already there. Um, you heard many of our panelists you know, talk about that briefly this morning as well and best practices with that. Once a project that did occur in the special flood hazard area, once that project is complete, the community is responsible um, to ensure that the development um, met the community's floodplain regulations, meaning they built to how they said they would build and make sure they're meeting those regulations. Um, and that also includes obtaining documentation and maintaining that documentation on file as well. And then lastly, the community is responsible for addressing any violations of their floodplain regulations, and that's just through the community's enforcement procedures, just as they would for any other zoning violation. I'm sorry if you can hear that ringing. My desk phone's ringing right now. So adoption and enforcement of floodplain regulations that meet minimum NFIP requirements is obviously a requirement for the community to remain in good standing with the program. Um, that being said, even when a town or a city's regulations are followed, um, even if they're followed to a T, it doesn't mean that those areas are completely safe from flooding. Buildings can still suffer damage or suffer, or, um, excuse me, experience effects from flooding. So reasons for this could include changes to the floodplain since the last issuance of the of the flood maps. Um, so any development or non-building development that has occurred that would change the way that water would flow during a flooding event um, that could obviously cause damage to structures. Additionally, larger and more severe floods can and do happen. As I noted a second ago, you know, those flood insurance rate maps that are produced by FEMA, those really map the 1% annual chance flood, but obviously, and as it's, you know, clear in New Hampshire, larger floods can happen and they have happened in the past. Additionally, again, those flood maps, um, they do not account for any future conditions. So that includes any future conditions that's just changing weather patterns or effects of climate change. Um, they really just show the representation of risk at the time that those maps were created. So for this reason, there are several communities throughout New Hampshire that have chosen to adopt higher standards that do go on the minimum requirements. Um, so to better protect those properties from the effects of flooding. And um, we heard, you know, from our three communities today, you know, Ryan Key have both have adopted higher standards to do that as well. So our office, the New Hampshire Floodplain Management Program, um, we have developed a model ordinance which contains the minimum regulations that a community must adopt in order to participate in the NFIP. Many communities in New Hampshire have adopted this or an older version of this ordinance. Um, and when we say minimum, just so everyone's aware, um, that is the regulations that are outlined in Title 44 of the Code of Federal Regulations. But that being said, we always encourage communities to adopt more stringent fund play regulations that go beyond the minimum requirements. Um, as adopting these types of standards can improve a community's resiliency to future floods. You know, we've heard our panelists talk about that today. You know, you're really helping the community as a whole by having those higher standards and higher level of protection. So for this reason, um, we have created a model ordinance that has higher standards with administrative procedures, as well as a menu of higher floodplain regulation standards um, for communities to use. So the model ordinance includes administrative procedures for tasks um, required for the program, such as permitting and making those substantial improvement and substantial damage determinations. And then the menu of higher um, floodplain regulation standards provides examples of recommended higher um, regulations that could be adopted a la carte, so to say. So a community could choose one, two, three, or all of them, or whatever fits well for their community and the needs of that specific community. Um, within that menu of higher standards, um, each of the higher standards also includes sample ordinance language um, for each standard, as well as um, links and resources for how to learn more about what that higher standard is. And then it also includes um, the CRS, so for the community rating system, it includes how many credits would be available if that was adopted. Um, so if the community is either in CRS or they're looking to get into CRS, you would be able to see what kind of points you could get for that as well. So at this point, I think I'm going to hand control over to, to Jen, and she's going to talk about some of those best practices as well. Okay, thanks, Katie. Um, so now we'll move on to um, 
guidance and best practices for effective local man floodplain management program. Um, we, our office developed this guidance and best practices, and its goal is really to assist communities in having an effective, compliant, and consistent um, procedures in place. As Katie mentioned, um, we developed a model ordinance that included many of these administrative procedures, but we also produced a standalone. So if communities didn't want to adopt it into um, your ordinance, we would have this procedures that could be adopted by the community. Um, and really these procedures are really to help guide you with the processes that you need to do to be compliant with the um, NFIP. So I'll be talking more about um, the top five um, um, topics that we talk about in these administrative um, in this um, guidance document, um, but the last three are, we don't really address these, but I'll address them now. Um, as far as floodplain development or variances, as you've noted from the panel discussion, um, in general, we don't like to see variances um, from the floodplain regulations. Um, it is a life safety um, based ordinance, um, but that we re recognize that there are could be extenuating circumstances. Um, so there are three additional um, requirements for a variance from a floodplain uh, regulation beyond the five required state variance criteria. Um, if you're interested in learning more, um, um, our office um, is having our annual planning and zoning conference on April 29th. And one of the sessions is me talking about floodplain variances. Um, if you can't make that, we are recording it um, and we'll be posting information about where it being on our YouTube um, channel following the conference. So if you're interested on in that, um, stay tuned for that. Um, we talked a lot about floodplain development enforcement process um, during our panel discussion. Um, it is in state statute. What, um, it's the same thing as what you would do with any other zoning ordinance. Um, and um, so we've already discussed that. Records um, as a participating community of the National Flood Insurance Program, communities are required to keep records of determinations that they make from regards to their floodplain regulations um, and in perpetuity um, as part of your um, participation in the program. All right. So we'll start out um, talking about the administrative uh, procedures that we've talked about um, that are in our model ordinance. And really, this is just something that I, our office had put together um, just based on my experience working with community um, over my time doing this program. Um, it's really to ensure community adherence and consistency for all properties. Um, some communities are dealing with floodplain um, development every day. Some are not dealing with it very often. It's kind of here and there. So sometimes it's forgotten how you how you did the last um, permit for one property to the next property, specifically to floodplains. Um, so these administrative procedures can include all the responsibilities related to a community's participation in the, in the NFIP. It can. I've also seen a lot of turnover in communities. I've kind of helped communities set up a permit process. Um, and then six years later, I'm back with new staff um, doing kind of the same thing. So this is kind of a way to get it written down to detail what your procedures are for your community. So if you do have a staff change, it can be a seamless transition um, to be used at. And again, every community is different. Every community's flood risk is different. Every community's um, staffing is different. Every community has different levels of building inspection or zoning. Um, so this certainly can be customized for each community. Um, and then also inland versus coastal communities, there can be a difference there as well. So we have templates for um, both cases. And these are available on our website. Um, we'll be talking about where our website is at the end. Public outreach is a big piece of it. Um, again, Depending on your community um, and how often you're dealing with floodplain development, um, we have some communities that participate in the program that do not have other zoning. Um, so this may be their only permitting process. So it's important for their residents to understand that there are um, regulations in place for floodplain development. 
Um, so we've put together some um, kind of sample templates to help get the word out to your community about the fact that you have floodplain regulations. Um, so we have, you know, posters or just things that you can put up in town hall or put into a, a usual mailing just to let people know that you do have floodplain regulations and they do need to come in for permitting. Um, so we have that information available to you. So that's an important piece, not only about the regulations, but to just to keep reminding it, periodically reminding residents that there is a rip, there is chance of uh, flood risk in your community. And so if they don't have a lender requiring them to have flood insurance, they may not be thinking about that. So it's important just to keep your residents um, aware of the um, potential for flood risk. Um, all of our panelists kind of talked about um, how they deal with floodplain determinations. As Dave mentioned, GIS, that's probably one of the biggest ways that you can kind of um, make a determination. Um, our office has the New Hampshire Flood Hazards Viewer. Um, that is a tool that can be used by communities to help you make that determination. In many cases, we have the parcel level data that's available in the state on our viewer, so that can help you as well. Um, all of FEMA's maps, except for Belknap County, are in digital format. So those GIS layers are available, um, and some communities have incorporated that into your um, online assessor's database. Um, so that's, again, another way that you can help make that determination. But communities ultimately are responsible for making sure that if someone's coming in um, to do something, that you're making a determination whether or not it's in the special flood hazard area or not. So there are many different ways that you can set that up based on what your um, resources are in your community. Um, and the floodplain development, um, every community that has a floodplain regulation has a statement that all proposed development in a special flood hazard area requires a permit. And if you look at the definition for development, it's um, Development is very broad. It doesn't just include buildings. It also calls includes non-building development. So if someone's bringing in fill, it's a way for a community to know how much fill is being brought in, whether or not um, there's anything in the ordinance that will require um, some compliance to be done with that fill. Um, so we highly recommend that communities have a floodplain development permit. You can use your building permit as kind of a starting point, but if it triggers, um, but it's just to account for those cases where you don't have a building, um, that you have a permit process in place to deal with the non-building development. Um, and I know that um, we have several communities in the state. Um, Rye has one, um, City of Lebanon has one. Um, you can use our template or you can use whatever, um, application format that you want to use. It's just important to have that permit application um, for that non-building development. And we are happy to work with communities on developing a permit application. We've done that in the past. So, so again, just please feel free to reach out to us. We talked about elevation certificates during um, the panel discussion. Um, again, I mentioned it was a best practice. It's not required under the NFIP, but it is a good thing to have. Um, it can be also be used for other purposes um, other than um, community compliance. It can also be used for flood insurance purposes or um, if someone wanted to seek a relief from being in the floodplain, if they know that their um, property is on land that's higher than the um, base flood elevation or 100-year flood elevation, they can seek to get removed um, from the floodplain. Um, it relieves them from flood insurance purposes with a lender and from um, community floodplain regulations, but it doesn't necessarily relieve them from the flood risk, but um, it is an option out there that an elevation certificate can be used. Um, and just a note that um, FEMA is currently working on updating the elevation certificate. Um, once that has been released, we will let everybody know about that. Um, there are some big changes in the elevation certificate because the elevation certificate is now 
addressing the new um, blood insurance methodology that FEMA implemented about a year or two ago. Um, so those are the couple of the changes that are being being made to the elevation certificate. <clears throat> substantial improvement and substantial damage determinations. We talked a little bit about that during the panel. Um, this is probably the most um, complicated and sometimes confusing process of your floodplain reg regulations. Um, this is the 50% rule that um, Kim talked about is um, if someone is improving their structure and the total cost of those improvements are greater than um, equal to or greater than 50% of the, of the market value um, of the structure itself, if, if that is 50% or more, um, then um, full compliance of the floodplain regulations are um, then required. Um, so there are a lot of different steps and a lot of different things that you have to be aware of when it comes to substantial improvement and substantial damage. So we've put together an application packet with a um, substantial improvement, substantial damage application um, just to help communities walk through those steps of what needs to be done. It's also, um, we also put together a property owner um, information guide to kind of help property owners understand the process and why a community needs to ask them for all this information. Um, so it's kind of transparent for both the community official and the applicant in the substantial improvement, substantial damage um, process. So again, that is on, available on our website if you want to take a look at that. It's customizable for the community. We just have the template to get you started. I'm happy to work with um, any communities that want to set something up. We've mentioned before um, that the state has adopted the 2018 codes as of July of last year. Um, a lot there are flood provisions in those state failing codes that um, exceed the minimum standards of the NFIP. So we just want to make communities aware um, that because many communities ad have adopted the minimum standards of the NFIP, um, but the state building code requires all buildings to be compliant with the state building code. Um, we realize that communities have different levels of enforcement of the state building code. If you don't have a building inspector, it um, falls to other people to enforce that. Um, but just to be aware, um, FEMA has a great um, comparison of the NFIP and the um, 2018 I codes. Um, it's a great graphical representation of kind of the differences between it. Um, not sure if you can see that graphic at the bottom. That um, represents the freeboard requirements or um, under the minimum NFIP standards, the lowest floor of a structure has to be elevated at least to the base flood elevation, um, which is the 100 year flood elevation. In the state building code for residential structures, you have to be look, elevate that lowest floor at least um, one foot above um, that base flood elevation. So that is one key difference that we do have in the state now, that all buildings in a special flood hazard area has to at least meet that standard. Um, some of the other things that the flood provisions um, are higher standards in on the state building code um, that are not in the NFIP requirements mostly deal with um, the coastal areas themselves. Um, when FEMA remapped the coastal area um, of the state in 2021, um, it does now inc include a feature called the limit of moderate wave action. So this is an additional um, feature on, for the communities that are directly along the Atlantic coast. Um, these communities already have velocity zones enabled as zone v VE. So this um, indicates areas where um, there's wave action three feet or greater. The limit of moderate wave action indicates an area between that velocity zone and that limit of moderate wave action where the waves are one and a half feet to three feet. Um, FEMA has done studies that have shown that um, damage can be caused to buildings 
um, up to one and a half feet of wave action. So they have delineated this on the coastal maps. Um, and the state building code um, acknowledges these, what they call coastal A zones, which are delineated, delineated by this limit of moderate wave action. So if you can see on this slide, there's the black line that has the little flag indications. Um, this is the limit of water, moderate wave action. This, this is not the same of what the um, maps look like, but this is a kind of a cartoon version of it. So any area between that area and that VE, um, they're mostly delineated as coastal, um, oh, sorry. They're delineated as zone AE areas, um, but when they are within that um, area of the coastal A zone, um, even though they're AE, the building code requires that buildings be built to VE standards in those areas. Um, so that's, um, we have a summary of when the 2015 codes went effective, and then also a summary of the 2018 code. There weren't a lot of changes when the 2018 codes um, went into effect, um, but we have that information available on our website as well for more details. So kind of just wrap up our um, brief presentation. Um, some of the key takeaways that we want to take away with is to make sure you have an effective permit and enforcement process for all development in special flood hazard areas. Um, as I said, um, periodically, the state, we at the state and FEMA will do check-ins with communities just to make sure that you're doing what you need to be doing as a participating community of the NFIP. So it's really important to have that effective um, permit um, and enforcement process. And if you need to develop um, administrative procedures, we highly recommend that just to ensure that you are adhering and being consistent um, and maintaining your good standing in the NFIP. Um, just have a good understanding of your floodplain regulations. And there's just, as Dave mentioned, there's a lot of good um, FEMA guidance materials, which we do have on our website. Um, so just get to know that. Um, and become familiar with the community's floodplain maps um, and the flood insurance study that accompanies it. Currently, we have a lot of um, FEMA mapping studies underway in the state, so we'll be contacting communities along over the next several years as maps, the new maps go effective, so just to be aware of that. And just being partic participating in um, any of the mapping um, meetings that are going to be going on up until those maps become effective. It's really important for us to hear from the communities on your input on new floodplain maps. Um, Katie and I do a lot of training and we re record all of our um, trainings on our, our uh, YouTube page. So um, if they're always available, um, webinars that we've conducted. If you can't make those, we do have those up on our YouTube page. Um, we will be having another basics um, coming up um, sometime this spring. So stay tuned for that. And again, um, Katie and I are available to assist wherever we can. Um, so just reach out and contact us. Um, this is our contact information. That is our current website. Um, as if you've been to our website, we're still under our old agency of the Office of Strategic Initiatives, but we will be migrating to our new agency at Department of Business and Economic Affairs. Um, and that is looking like it will be, um, that transition will be happening on May 1st. So stay tuned for more information about that. And that is all that we have. All right, great, thank you. Um, similar setup as uh, questions to the panelists. Um, if anyone has questions directly for or Jen uh, or Katie, um, either enter them in the chat and we can address them or feel free to raise your hand and uh, we'll unmute you. We'll say there was nothing in the chat as you were talking, so. We'll see if anything pops up in the next minute or so. I'll just note that for anybody who hasn't noticed the chat, as Jen was going through those best practices, I was putting in the links for those to our website, the direct links I can bring you to that. So.
Yeah, thank you for that. That's great material. And and Jen mentioned um, all the resources that FEMA provides too. Um, it's on the FEMA website. I mean, it's they have quite a substantial amount of of resources and um, a lot of pages to go through. But uh, I think if you ask Jen and Katie where to look, they'll be able to direct you to the specific page. <laughs> I'm not seeing any. We can give it another minute while um, I'm kind of wrapping up and, and saying thank you. Uh, oh, and Kirsten, throwing us a bone here if you. Oh, nope. Not a question. <laughs> yeah. And Katie and Jen's contact information is there too. I know, and I'm speaking for them. Um, they're always. As uh willing to help and answer any questions you have um so feel free to contact them i will put um some contact information for folks from the coastal program as well um and if you have any questions about this flood smart seacoast project that we're that we're developing and, and working on um then we'll put some contact information in the chat and uh yeah Thank you, Kristen, for that. Feel free to share any chat in the chat, any experiences you have with your own community floodplain management. Yeah, maybe you did something different that the panelists might not have done, and you have a good idea that might have uh, helped some people out. Uh, yes, we always yeah, love thank... hearing from people, uh, communities of what they're doing, kind of best practices, because that really helps us to get the word out to the other communities as well. Absolutely. It's a team effort for sure. All right. Well, I think uh, I think we'll start wrapping things up. Um, a few people signed off, and I don't see anything else working in the chat. Um, so again, I want to thank our our panelists, Mike, Kim, and Dave. Um, I can't quite see if any of you are still on, but um, appreciate you taking the time and having the conversation with us. And hopefully, folks were able to to hear something new from our panelists and something new from Katie and Jen. Um, yeah, Margaret, glad you uh, glad you got some good information. Um, we're gonna stop recording in a minute. Um, thank all the attendees, obviously, for, for signing up. Um, this is huge and very helpful. Um, and thanks to Jen and Katie for that presentation and the quick rundown. I feel like this could be a, a whole series just specific to elevation certificates or substantial improvement and damage, those types of things. Um, so again, if anybody has questions about anything specific, absolutely reach out. Um, with, uh, I do have a note here with um, the ending of this presentation, we are gonna have an evaluation. Um, hopefully uh, you can fill that out and give us some good feedback or negative feedback, constructive criticism. Um, all of it's helpful. So that will be coming uh, via email um, through the registration link and, and you'll just get it uh, most likely uh, either this afternoon or tomorrow. And yeah, hopefully you can fill that out and help us out. Um, Jan and Katie, any final thoughts that I may have missed? I think I covered it all. I think you did great, Brendan. All right. Yeah, and these recordings will be available on uh, the OPD website or the OSI website, as Jen said, they're going to be transitioning in May. Um, and also the the DES YouTube channel, if uh, you feel like distrib distributing, uh, distributing, there you go, um, to any of your colleagues or anybody that might be interested. So uh, yeah, we appreciate everybody's time today.